I'm Professor David Wilson. As a criminologist, I'm often asked, what's it like to interview a murderer? This is a tape-recorded interview. The date is 11 17 of 84. To answer this question, I'm going to take you on a journey into the dark heart of the police interrogation room. Using cutting-edge lip-sync technology, we'll bring to life the actual tape confessions of some of the world's most notorious killers. I put tape on her mouth and held it there so she couldn't breathe. And bring you face to face with evil. I felt sick looking at him, knowing what he did. And along with forensic psychologist, Professor Michael Brooks, I'll analyze their interviews in unparalleled detail. Her skull gave way a little bit. She was there and immediately unconscious. Their wicked words, now seen spoken for the very first time, will never be forgotten. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, I knew that she had to be gone. The case we feature today reveals the darkest depths of the human psyche. A married couple who killed as a folie a deux only for the wife to betray their evil vows to one another by saving her own skin with a controversial plea bargain. They were every parent's worst nightmare, abducting and murdering children in Canada. And yet the murderers were the most unlikely child killers imaginable. Outwardly, they were attractive, well-dressed professionals who lived in a high-rent neighborhood and had lots of friends. Their schoolgirl victims were abducted as they went about their daily lives in the state of Ontario, only to then be held prisoner while a variety of sexual tortures were performed on them, some of which were videotaped. The wife, on realizing the pair were going to be caught, confessed to her uncle. She obtained a lawyer and began negotiations for a plea bargain in exchange for her testimony against her husband. This would become known all over the world as the deal with the devil. Today we hear the very rare recording of this extraordinary plea bargain that condemns her husband to a life in prison. From him, we hear his police interview and the rage he reserves for his duplicitous wife. Who is this married couple for whom the deaths of innocent children ultimately did part? Carla Hamolka and Paul Bernardo. In May 1993, the anteroom of a Canadian courthouse in Ontario saw the stage set for one of the most extraordinary confessions to murder in criminal history. 23-year-old Carla Hamolka was about to turn Queen's counsel against her husband, Paul Bernardo, in a bid to win a more lenient sentence for herself. She was about to name him as the principal protagonist in the murder of three girls, one of whom was Hamolka's own sister, 15-year-old Tammy. In her defense, she was to paint herself as an abused wife forced to do her husband's bidding. During her deposition, which would last some 10 hours, Hamolka revealed the couple's deadly M.O. We see a girl, we're gonna stop. I'm gonna ask her for directions. I'm gonna try and get her over to the car. So he wanted her right beside him so he could hold the knife to her. Where to begin? A truly horrific, monstrous coupling. I thought at one point of calling them the Ken and Barbie from hell, but that would be to trivialize their depravity. This case is particularly chilling because A, it involves a couple in a romantic relationship that embarked on a career of violence and killing. 
at the same time, the callous way in which they maintained and developed their normal life. For serial killers, if they're in a partnership, the combination must, must be so combustible. It's a very rare phenomenon. None of us can really understand how two people can egg each other on in such a horrible way. Paul Bernardo and Carlo Homolka were a particularly horrible couple. Her feet were tied with that electrical cord that he had used to kill Leslie. There was electrical cord around her neck. He anally raped her and then he strangled her after he was done. It stands out really clear in my mind because the night before I left him, he did the exact same thing to me, only he didn't kill me. Well, Carla Homolka is setting out her stall. This is a plea bargain. These are her depositions, and if this plea is accepted, she doesn't spend the rest of her natural life in prison. And the story she tells is of being an abused wife. To what extent should we believe that? Well, there's elements of truth in there, but what she does is she minimises her involvement. So she's going to give the prosecutors, the interviewers, as much information as she thinks that she needs to that uh, she can get as light a sentence as possible while at the same time holding back significant aspects of her involvement. Determined to deny her own culpability, Homolka painted herself as a woman who lived in total fear of her husband. If I didn't say the right thing, he'd hit me. He held knives to my throat. He told me I better watch my back. Um, he said, always watch your back with me. She's got to sell herself to the authorities. She's got to make out that she's being domineered by him. She's acting in fear of her own life. She's got to sell herself as having useful information that they can use against her husband. As Hamolka sought to control her own destiny through her deposition, on the other side of town, her husband, Paul Bernardo, found his fate totally at the mercy of the Canadian police. His inquisitors were two of the force's most experienced detectives, and as well as Homolka's deposition, they had an array of damaging evidence to support the case, which put Bernardo in the frame for three murders. My name is uh, Detective Brad Hoover. My badge number is 6188. I went to Toronto Police Service, Sex Crimes Unit. Who's you ever yourself? Paul Jason Teal. As we move forward through these clips, Michael, how should we best judge this folia de, this madness shared by two, this killer couple? How should we best judge who's in charge, who's subservient? So we know that these situations occur in which there can be a dominant male and a female can establish a relationship with that dominant male and become involved in some quite horrific acts and be responsible for pain being inflicted upon others if not themselves and actually inflicting the pain so we have that history we have that record and we know that these are possibilities but sometimes we need to track back to the beginning of the relationships to the expectations within the relationships to, to understand how it could get to that point where she does those things. The pair of them met when Carla was attending a veterinary conference and it was during this conference that she went for a meal with a friend and that evening when she was dining with the friend, Paul Bernardo walked through the door and Almost instantly, the pair were attracted to each other. It was this kind of love, lust at first sight. It's a case of two worlds collide. Automatically, something chemical and physical and emotional happened between them. They have sex on the first occasion they meet and they form a bond over their indulgence and sadomasochism. There was this animalistic passion between the pair and they became very much inseparable. 
Carla's family loved Paul. They thought he was a perfect choice for a husband. He had been to university and he had studied accountancy. He was a really good-looking, charming man who was going to sweep Carla off of her feet. They were seen as the perfect couple. When they had the wedding, it was all uh, dressed in white, a uh, very flash, very showy wedding. It really looked like a fairy tale wedding, but there were rumours that people thought this was a bit of a farce. Although they looked happy, there was some speculation that things weren't quite as they seemed. On the couple's wedding night, Bernardo had revealed a dark and deadly revelation to his new bride. He confessed to being a notorious sex offender that the police had been trying to catch for many years. To the press and the media, he, he's, he's known as the uh, Scarborough Rapist and has committed at least 13 rapes, which are all pretty brutal and horrible, involving um, humiliating and physically abusing his victims and he had this obsession with taking uh, female virginity. In many ways, Bernardo was continuing a pattern of sexual abuse that had defined his own childhood. His father, Kenneth, was a convicted child molester who had also abused his own daughter. Bernardo's own mother withdrew from the outside world and would end her days living as a recluse in the basement of the family home in Scarborough in Toronto. By the time Bernardo was in his 20s, he was a prolific sex offender linked to over 15 violent assaults on young women. He acted like he didn't care that we got married. He told me that he was a Scarborough racist and it just was not like the kind of wedding night for those things to happen. I remember my own wedding night very vividly and very happily. The idea that on your wedding night, your partner could tell you that he in fact is the Scarborough rapist is extraordinary, isn't it? What would a normal, rational person do on hearing that kind of information? So right from the off, there, there is a different um, set of understandings between one another than there is in um, non-BDSM relationships. That's not to say that all are involved in BDSM and relationships actually can go on to commit acts of homicide, but that there, there, there is a disturbing history when, when you look at um, their premarital behaviour. In the past, Paul had been with women who were essentially horrified by his sexual sadism, but Carla seemed to enjoy it. She seemed to even in, encourage it. So they've got this really intensely dark side where they're both just living this depraved fantasy life, but they, they carry out their depravity into real life. While her husband festers in a prison cell, refusing to help the police, Homolka is well into her lengthy deposition as she matter-of-factly describes her role in a horrific series of crimes, she shows no emotion. The flat affect in her voice, suggestive of her lack of compassion and her air of grandiosity, a lack of remorse, all classic hallmarks of psychopathy. The only time her voice quivers with emotion is when she chooses to frame herself as the wronged party, a classic ploy of killers to try and gain sympathy. As the plea bargain progresses, more and more details of their shocking MO as killers emerge. Yet nothing can prepare those present for when she describes how she abducted and drugged her own sister, Tammy. Intended as a sickening Christmas gift to her husband, her sister died. Hamolka slipped an animal tranquilizer into Tammy's rum and eggnog on the evening of the 23rd of December in their parents' house. Whilst the young girl was unconscious, Bernardo had sex with her. So did Carla. Each of them videotaped the other in the act. Carla's parents were at home, in another room, unaware. Then Tammy began to vomit. Bernardo and Homolka carried her into her bedroom and laid her in her bed and then called an ambulance. 
They didn't tell the medical personnel about the drug she'd ingested. Tammy died the next day on Christmas Eve. Beyond any doubt, this is one of the most appalling acts of fratricide in modern criminal history. December 23rd, 1990. Paul and Carla gathered at the Homolka family home to commence their Christmas celebrations. Paul started to develop these very dark and twisted feelings towards Carla's younger sister, Tammy. Tammy was only 15 and she was a virgin. Carla became aware of this. And so because she was so in love with him, she would have done absolutely anything to keep hold of him. And knowing that the one thing he wanted was a virgin, she offered up Tammy's virginity to him. Carla decided that this would be the night that she would offer her sister Tammy to Paul as an early Christmas present. She was just 15 years old. You know, he talked about how he really liked her, how she was getting really cute, things like that at first. And I would say, yeah, she is, because she was a beautiful girl. Tammy was part of the family. She was a readily available potential victim. There was a, a reason for Carla to offer her up. And of course, Tammy was seen as pure and virginal. The plan was for me to get sleeping pills. And so I picked the Halcyon. It seemed to be, have the least side effects. And death was not listed. I don't remember who decided that we needed the halothane. I guess it would probably be me knowing more about anesthetics and the fact that sleeping pills might not keep her completely asleep. Carla stole drugs from the veterinary centre where she worked. The drug used to sedate Tammy was a powerful anesthetic often used to sedate horses. Whilst it can cause dangerous side effects for humans, Tammy was given an enormous dose. What they had done was slipped her the drugs into her drink, and as she drank bit by bit, the drugs took effect, and eventually Tammy passed out. They applied a, a cloth to her face with more anaesthetic. And while this happened, Paul raped Tammy, and the entire time they filmed the whole thing. As one of the most horrific sexual assaults imaginable was unfolding, the rest of the family were totally unaware. The couple, fearing they would be caught and wanting to prolong their twisted pleasure and Tammy's torment, took the youngster downstairs to the basement in order to prolong the abuse. Tammy then was sick. Um, she vomited and she choked on the vomit. The drugs and alcohol in the 15-year-old system caused her to choke on her own vomit and her internal organs eventually failed. The two of them then just cleaned up and made it appear as if Tammy had drunk too much. Before the pair would call 911, they quickly made sure that everything was as it should be for this to look like an accident. And when paramedics arrived, they insisted that they had done everything they could to help Tammy. The Homolka family spent an agonizing night in hospital at Tammy's bedside. Tragically, on Christmas Eve, she was pronounced dead. Homolka and Bernardo played the part of grieving relatives to perfection. No one suspected them 
of playing any part in her death. Everybody assumed that she had died from a vomit and not from the overdose of the drug, which is used to anesthetize animals. And the hospital actually believed this story, despite this burn mark that was on her face. The hospital had it explained by Paul that Paul had been dragging Tammy's body up the stairs, and this was uh, a carpet burn and not, in fact, a, a chemical burn from the anaesthetic. When quizzed about the burn mark that had occurred on her sister's face, Hamolka denied any part in administering the halothane anaesthetic soaked rag over her mouth and that Bernardo had done it without her knowledge. Those burns are possibly chemical in nature and anti-mortem. The only chemical that was near her was the halothane. It was not placed on her face directly. It was held, as I said, like this, this far away. I don't remember who decided that we needed the halothane. I guess it would probably be me knowing more about anesthetics. Michael, help, help people understand this idea that you've alluded to once or twice of cognitive dissonance. What, what does that actually mean? So that's um, the situation in when you act in a way that goes against what you think is the right way to act. And so there's that distance that's created within you between knowing how you should act and how you actually act. And is what Hamolka is describing in this particular clip we've just listened to, an example of cognitive dissonance? Not necessarily, because actually she's actually involved. She's engaging in it. But actually that is more than just cognitive dissonance. What would you characterize it as? It's active participation with, within this homicide. When you think it's about as sick as it can get, it gets sicker. She dresses in her dead sister's clothes as a sexual attraction to Bernardo, which for me causes me to think of um, an expression which could enter the lexicon of depravity, and it's necrophilia by proxy. And it's extraordinary that a young woman could plumb these depths of depravity. And instead of thinking how lucky they were, all it did was to prompt them into committing even worse, more serious offences. They seemed to egg each other on. It was a double act. It will absolutely have served as a really solid foundation from which then went on much more audaciously to actually go outside of the home environment, target young women in their local communities, who they then went on to commit horrific crimes against. With his wife making the so-called deal with the devil, Bernardo is left with only two choices. Confess and condemn himself forever as a child murderer and rapist, or refuse to cooperate with the police and label Hamolka a liar. During his police confessions, he has none of her cool or thoughtful composure. He wavers wildly from being arrogant and excitable to glib and grandiose, with considerable vitriol reserved for his wife. The contrast between the two as personalities and as performers is extraordinary and perhaps more clearly than anything demonstrates how crucial Hamolka was as part of the killing couple. The power they had over each other was considerable, but when combined, the power that they had over their victims was insurmountable. It was clear that as a couple they were going to escalate, that they had very violent sexual fantasies that would only be satisfied by killing. There was often a pattern in the need to heighten the abuse in order to achieve the same level of emotional gratification. 
it's comparable in some ways to drug abuse. It is an addictive pattern of behavior. During her deposition, Hamolka claimed that Bernardo was so thrilled by having gotten away with a sexual murder, he was determined to do it again. And he was also determined that they would become a killing couple. He kept on pushing and pushing and pushing, and finally I said, okay. And thinking that it would be one time, that's it. He would shut him up, and he would stop bothering me and stop hurting me. The next person to be targeted after Tammy was Leslie Mahaffey, and she was a young girl who Paul literally robbed out of her backyard as she crept home one night, and he almost boasted, look what I've got. He brought home another victim for them. He said that he was going to keep Leslie as a sex slave. Once in the house, he gave Leslie some champagne. Hamolka was enraged by what she was seeing. She was shocked to see Leslie in the house and even more upset to see her drinking with her husband out of their very expensive champagne glasses. Oh, and I was really mad too because there were two champagne glasses on the dining room table. And we had these really expensive champagne glasses from France, which we never used. We had those out. The two of them had been drinking champagne from those glasses. And I was really mad. Hamolka, by now, realized what Bernardo was intending to do with Leslie. As the women spoke to each other, he saw the opportune moment to once again reach for the cloth doused with halothane anesthetic and place it over the young girl's mouth. The pair tortured Leslie, they sexually assaulted her, they raped her, they sodomized her, they degraded her in every way possible over the last few hours of her life, and eventually they strangled her to death. The killing couple subjected the teenager to the most terrifying and sadistic ordeal imaginable. And after the assaults, they offered her a teddy bear to hold for comfort. So he went over to her and he did the same thing, he strangled her more. And I think I watched that time. What the hell, she's dead anyway. Like after murdering Leslie, she was disposed of in the most un undignified manner. She was dismembered by Paul and encased in concrete. People started finding blocks of concrete on a nearby lake. And within these blocks of concrete were the limbs of Leslie Mahaffey. Bernardo has so far remained largely silent and uncooperative with the police. But once he gets wind of Homolka talking to the police, he finds himself both betrayed and enraged. But he was kept in the dark about the extent of her revelations, which would extend to all three murders the pair committed. Did you kill on June the 19th, 1990? Well, it's a loaded question. I mean. Are we going to go back and, 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 and go through the, the time sequence of what happened in my life? I mean, I, I could just give a yes or no answer, but you know, there's a lot of issues about that. Um, did you have anything to do with her disappearance? No. Had you ever met her? Now we we're steeped in understanding the psychopath, but for me, one element of the psychopathic personality which we saw and heard in that last clip though was narcissism. He is absolutely enjoying all the attention that's coming his way, is he not? So you have to balance this, this need to preserve some sense of self and some sense of identity set against um, this narcissistic tendency uh, and aspect of his personality. Having gotten away with two murders, Bernardo was determined to kill again. And this time, it would be Hamolka who would seek out their third victim. The next person they target is a young girl by the name of Kristen French. As Kristen walks home from school one day, close to Easter weekend, the pair hone in on her. 
They have made themselves appear as though they're a couple in distress and they ask her if she can give them directions. And Kristen, not suspecting anything and thinking this are a friendly, young, lost couple, she tries to help them. He kept saying, go through what we're going to do. So I said, well, if we see a girl, we're going to stop. I'm going to ask her for directions. I'm going to try and get her over to the car. So he wanted her right beside him so he could hold the knife to her. And I sat in the back seat, actually more in the middle of the two of the front seats. And I held her hair and I held her head. Hamolka and Bernardo took Kristen to their basement, where she was bound and intoxicated through being forced to drink alcohol. They torture her. They inflict the most grotesque injuries on her you could possibly imagine. Astonishingly, Hamolka would claim in her testimony that this was a murder that subjected her to emotional torment, all because in her own mind, she had created the fantasy that the women had become friends during the short time they had spent together as the petrified girl pleaded for her life. I never should have gotten to know Kristen because you get emotionally involved with these people and it really hurts. It hurts a lot more because I felt like I was friends with both of them, especially Kristen, because we did so much stuff together. We put makeup on together. We talked, you know, just girl talk when Paul was gone getting us food and it just made it hurt even more. Despite Tomolka's claims of friendship, in reality she wasn't just participating in the assault, but also recording it for posterity. Kristen was held captive and tortured for three whole days before her life was finally ended. Her dead body was driven out into the backwoods and dumped. Kristen French was found in a ditch at uh, the side of a road nearby. Her face was completely battered and she was virtually un unidentifiable from that and her head had been shaved. I never should have gotten to know Kristen because you get emotionally involved with these people. We talked. You know, just girl talking with Paul was going getting us food, and it just made it hurt even more. Wow. I mean, I, I found that clip particularly astonishing and harrowing. Um, effectively, Hamolka's admitting holding uh, a victim whilst Bernardo kills Kristen, the victim. Um, and yet she claims to be emotionally involved. And, and um, the victim is her friend. So there's some active engagement in there. And so, again, though, she's building up um, this picture. She's constructing for the interviewers and constructing for us ever after a particular picture that she wants to paint, which minimizes her role and maximizes his. Absolutely, and so she's wanting to attract the sympathy of those who are um, investigating the case to say, actually, this, this was coercion. I, I felt bad about it. Even if you take um, an analytical perspective and say that well, she actually enticed the victim and she engaged within that um, homicide as well actively. So there's a uh, complete um, disparity there between um, what she actually um, did and what she says. She doesn't want to recognise her own involvement. It's almost that she can't put any emotion into it. She can't put it in any other way because she understands the severity of what she's done. By now, the full extent of Hamolka's testimony has been delivered to Bernardo. As he sat confronted with the reality at being forced to spend the rest of his life behind bars, Bernardo was forced to reflect upon the reasons his wife had betrayed their deadly pact. In the months leading up to her going to the police, tensions at home had escalated, with incidents of spousal abuse becoming increasingly commonplace. Paul's ferocious attitudes towards Carla 
had started to gather momentum. He wanted more sexual activity, he wanted more fun. And that, over a while, started turning into domestic violence now. And he was beating her black and blue, and he was really becoming very violent. If I didn't say the right thing, he'd hit me. He held knives to my throat. He told me I better watch my back. Um, he said, always watch your back with me. During one attack upon his wife, Hamolka was hospitalized with head injuries. She was visited by the police, whose interest in her husband's violence extended beyond any concern they had for her. They wanted to question Hamolka about whether she had any suspicions that Bernardo was the Scarborough rapist. A DNA sample he had given in a sweep of all local men some two years earlier had offered a positive match to one of his victims. The net was now closing in and Hamolka anticipated rightly that the game was up. One of the last of the Scarborough rapist attacks, his victim was able to uh, identify the rapist and draw uh, quite a good likeness of Paul. It was then that a work colleague saw a description of the Scarborough rapist in the media and recognised it as potentially being Paul Bernardo. Carla Hamolka, in her own wisdom, decided, I'm not going down for this. I need to now start telling the truth about what happened. She wants an escape. There's no way that she wants to share his fate. Throughout her deposition process, Hamolka always portrayed herself as an abused wife forced into participating in Bernardo's criminal activity. It wasn't until the videotapes that Hamolka and Bernardo made were turned over to the police by an ex-lawyer of Bernardo's that it became clear that Hamolka enjoyed herself with their victims and the truth of her involvement in the crimes came to light. Regardless of her obvious guilt, a deal was a deal and she couldn't be retried for her crimes. Ultimately, she would serve just 12 years in prison. Bernardo ended up being convicted on all counts of rape and murder and he received a life sentence on the 1st of September 1995. At the trial, their crimes were accurately described as a catalogue of depravity and death. What we'll never know is that if they had remained at large, how many more innocent lives they would have taken. Hamolka's plea bargain was both calculated and cunning. By taking the initiative, she was able to attempt to dilute her own role in the murders and act as a compelling and convincing witness that would seal Bernardo's fate and help police to put him behind bars forever. It will forever be known as the deal with the devil. And it's clear from listening to the recordings that Hamolka delivers every word with the utmost conviction and impunity. He wanted to keep her for longer. And I didn't want to. Like, I was going to work. I didn't want to go to work knowing that this girl was in my house and she could escape so easily. I was afraid. There is a cynical end justifies the means uh, thread that runs through not just the American criminal justice system, but through any. And you can understand why the authorities would wish to be complicit in this. Otherwise, you're faced with a situation where she plays stump, doesn't say anything, and the police don't get the evidence that they need. If I didn't say the right thing, he'd hit me. He held knives to my throat. He told me I better watch my back. Um, he said, always watch your back with me. Bernardo by now realises that he's a totally condemned man. His only option is to label Homolka a liar and desperately try to convince the police of his innocence. Throughout his interviews, he is rambling and incredulous. My file says her version, and it's a lie. <laughs> you know, I'm not making frivolous points here. I mean, and now you're asking I'm lying about this, and then you're saying I'm lying about my profile, you're saying I'm lying if I'm better or not. Now you're saying, hey, did you kill this person? I mean, well, you're saying I'm lying here, here, and here. I could say, no, I didn't.
does he have a legitimate complaint that everybody seems to believe her and disbelieve him? Well, certainly he has a legitimate complaint in that um, they accepted her plea bargain and are accepting what she said. The extent to which um, the interviewers believe or disbelieve what he says um, is a separate matter and you need to set uh, what he says against the evidence. Did you feel he was controlling his emotions or did you feel in comparison to what we heard about Hamolka, he was running wild? He was certainly running wild for parts of the interview. Did you tell me happened in July? It was a girl in January after kidnapped and they got somebody, I picked up her bar that she tried to, to, to roll over and all, all these other issues, all relevant. You know, I know Carly's free now. I'm not, I'm not in the business of putting her in jail. It's not my thing. There's a kind of gratification to see him struggling and failing in his, his um, kind of grandiosity. Not looking at the interviewers, looking to one side. I imagined that he was going to be more of a controller. Carlos, my role, who did what, where, when, this is why I said, did you guys, you know, go down there to get a polygraph to get, to see if she was telling the truth? Like, why didn't Bevan do it in the first place? Have you guys gone down there and asked her? Have you settled the matter with it? Because you could say I lied or whatever, I'll call it that, but have you asked her? Because it, 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 it comes down to a lot of that issue. Okay. You know, you, know, you guys love doing that on this crazy psychopath or liar. You guys love doing that on this crazy psychopath or liar. The idea that he's concerned about being described as a psychopathic liar when he's been convicted of rape and serial murder is absurd, isn't it? But to survive, you need to have some sense of personal integrity, some sense of personal value. So no matter what you've done, you're still wanting to hold on to that. So it, it makes sense in, in many ways for him to um, emphasize those points. With Hamolka's deposition sealed and delivered, she was the first of the pair to stand trial. And once again, she put on a convincing performance. When she gets on the stand, she really does look, in all intents and purposes, like a vulnerable young woman. She was very plausible. She was almost a sympathetic person who again portrayed themselves as a victim. And if only she had it to do again, she would never do any of that. Because of the deal she had made with prosecutors, Hamolka was given a reduced sentence but over a year later, the police made a discovery. One, which had they done before the deal with the devil was made, would have almost certainly seen Hamolka spend the rest of her life in jail along with her husband. Police found videotapes of the murders that the couple had made, and the tapes demonstrated that Hamolka was not only an equal participant, but also derived equal pleasure from the commission of the crimes. When they were shown, people were disgusted. They were absolutely aghast. Not only was she participating in these, she didn't come across as the battered woman that she had portrayed herself to be. She seemed to be, in some cases, even more brutal than Paul was. She was already a fully paid up member of the perverse conspiracy. She was a, a willing accomplice. She was completely engaged and involved and enjoying it. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, I knew that she had to be gone. She played a very clever game. She actually got the, the deal for 12 years. Compared to the offences, she walked scot-free. I mean, her life is ruined, but not as, as ruined as the lives that she was in touch with. Having served her sentence, Hamolka was released from prison in 2005. She married her lawyer's brother and started a family. But Bernardo was sentenced to life imprisonment for his crimes and was denied parole in 2018. Rehabilitation, I think, is not a possibility for most serial killers. I think in this case it, it is possible. 
because of the nature of the relationship between them, the way it then unfolded towards the end when in fact the violence was then turned onto her in many respects. And I think the toxicity for her was in the relationship with him. Now the problem is, is she going to end up with either another dominant partner or somebody that she wants to dominate? Is she going to repeat that or has she had enough insight to know that she's got to go for Mr. Boring and go for normality? But the danger is that she might want to go back to a more exciting life. Even though there was this extraordinary transformation and was released and has apparently had what uh, many people would regard as then a totally unjustified normal life subsequently, I believe that that flawed potential remains.